Yes, guys, welcome back to 11 Yanks Breakdown, where we discuss all things USMNT. I'm Pete Dalton, and today we're going to have a quick look at the TNT game from the other night, but mostly we are going to be breaking down and analyzing and predicting the under-23 roster to compete for Olympic qualifying in March. Before we get into it, guys, if you're here for the first time, welcome. Don't forget to subscribe. If you're already subscribed, smash that like button. It helps other people to find us. Here we go. Okay, before we get into the Olympic stuff, I wanted to talk a little bit about the game the other night. I know I talked a lot about it in the hangout, the live hangout that we did afterwards, but basically what I wanted to cover was a few things. Mainly, how do you watch a game like that? Okay, as a fan, as an analyst, as a coach, as a whatever, you're watching a game like that, it's so one-sided, the opposition was so terrible, you blow them out of the water, it was the same when we played El Salvador a couple months back, and it's a difficult game to watch. Personally, I was laughing my head off most of the time because it was just so one-sided and not really a test for our boys. When a game is so one-sided like that, I look out for two things. The first one is patterns of play, okay? If you're looking for patterns of play, that tells you that there is a plan, that there's a tactical idea, that the coach is trying to set up a tactical plan and the players are trying to execute it. So regardless of the opponent, patterns of play is something I'm always watching out for. And we saw some patterns of play the other night that I was actually quite impressed with. And we're gonna get to those in just a minute. The other thing that I look for is individual ability on the ball. Yes, we can thrash teams like this and it can look Look very good on paper, but how do we know if any of these players are good enough to graduate to the next level? Or how do we know if it translates to a higher level? The way that I look at it is their technical ability on the ball, particularly under pressure in tight spaces. Top quality players who can play at high, high levels, elite players, those guys have ability on the ball. They can get out of sticky situations. You see their first touch in tight places. You see their ability to get out of traps. And so I was watching for that the other night. Now, I said in the live hangout that I wasn't particularly impressed with any of the players last night. And some of you agreed with me and some of you didn't. I was impressed by most players' ability to execute a tactical plan. I was impressed with their awareness of what they were supposed to be doing and how they were doing it. But as far as individual technical ability with the ball at their feet, I wasn't really that impressed with anybody. And look, you can disagree with me about this and that's totally fine. We can agree to disagree. That's the beauty of soccer. There's more than one way to see the game. I look for technical players that I know can stand the pressure and the speed of play at a high level. I didn't see that last night. Even if you look at the goals that we scored, two of them were offside. Two of them wouldn't have gone in if they had had a competent keeper in goal. So really we're talking about three decent goals that were well executed, but most of the goals that we scored came from them playing a very high line and us understanding the tactics of what we were doing to play men in behind and score goals. But over and over and over throughout the game, I saw poor first touches. I saw many players who were extremely one-footed. I saw passes that were hit too soft or too hard or not directly in front of the player. I saw a lot of technical deficiencies and that tells me the vast majority, if not all of these guys, are not gonna be able to cut it at a higher level. So if you wanna tell me that Sam Vines or Jesus Ferreira put on a masterclass last night, we can disagree about that and that's okay. They did what they were supposed to do. They followed instructions well, but almost nobody really impressed me with their individual technical ability and skill on the ball. Okay, so I wanted to look at some patterns of play from the game the other night, some things that I noticed, not only in this game, but also in the game against El Salvador last month, and basically show you what I think Greg was trying to do and how well we executed it in both of these games. So Greg talks a lot about using the ball to disorganize the opponent in midfield, and oftentimes that's not very specific, but what we saw in this game was a very clear idea of how he wanted to overload the midfield, and that means to gain an advantage in numbers in different parts of the field in order to progress the ball through the three thirds of the field. So it started off really with the goalkeeper. Uh, our, our fullbacks would stay high and wide and try to occupy their wingers because they were playing in a 4-4-2. So blue would be Trinidad and Tobago right now. And this is us, okay? Matt Turner has the ball. The ball would go wide to one of the defenders. And basically Long and Robinson would pass it back and forth until their front two stepped up to try and press us. Now, when we did that, we still had a superiority of 3v2 in our defensive half, okay? So there's your overload, 3v2. But even better, Jackson Ewell would drop deep and now you have a 4v2 advantage in your own defending half. And it was easy to play out of. One, two, three, four against their two. Then we would play the ball to Jackson Ewell and he would turn with it 
And at the exact same time as that would happen, Jesus Ferreira would drop from the front and come into the middle and now create basically another overload in the center of midfield. So here we go. We're at 4v2 in the center of midfield now. Easy to keep possession. Again, their wingers are occupied by our fullbacks. Their center backs don't know what to do. Do one of them drop with Jesus and leave room in behind for this guy to attack it? Or do they stay back? And mostly they stayed back. That being said, they did play a very high line to try and squeeze us. But the problem was because we had the numerical superiority in midfield, we were then able to get our guys in good positions to play through balls in behind their back line, which is where we got most of our goals from. So it's this idea of overloading the defensive third and then the middle third and playing between the lines so you can then play through the lines that I think Burhalter did quite well. Now, I've been a strong critic of Burhalter, particularly about some of his tactical things, but I want to give him kudos here for not only getting this plan together, but also getting his team to execute it. Because it's one thing to have these ideas in your head, but getting your guys on the field to execute a plan like that, where you gradually overload the different sections of the field in order to keep the ball and break down your opponent, that's not easy to do. So kudos to Burhalter for that. It was one of the patterns of play that I thought worked. Now, is that going to translate when we have our first team in Europe doing it against higher opponents? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Okay, so let's talk about the Olympic roster for qualifying. To be clear, I'm not talking about the Olympic roster in September. I'm talking about the qualifying roster for this March. This is going to be very difficult because a lot of the young under 23s that were playing in MLS are now in Europe. So it's going to make it even more difficult to put together a solid competitive roster for these qualifiers. The fact of the matter is the Olympic qualifiers are not a FIFA date. So no club is required to release their players. MLS clubs are more likely to release their players, A, because the MLS season isn't going to start until April, if it starts at all. We still don't know what's happening with the lockout. And B, MLS clubs are trying to sell players, it looks like. So sending them to these qualifiers and them putting on a good performance could enhance their transfer value. That being said, there is some overlap between the FIFA dates in March and the Olympic qualifiers. Let's have a look. So as you can see here, these are the CONCACAF dates, 18th to the 30th of March. That is for the qualifiers. Now, hopefully there will be a camp earlier than this where a lot of the players can get called in. Maybe they can play a friendly or two because this is going to be in Mexico, guys. Remember, the U.S. playing in Mexico is very different than the U.S. playing at home, and it's something we cannot take for granted. The FIFA dates are the 22nd to the 31st of March. So there's about eight days of overlap there where maybe there are certain European players who aren't getting as much playing time as we would like or aren't crucial players for their team that European clubs might be like, okay, we're going to let this guy go. Personally, I'm not counting on very many of the European-based players to come for this. I think it's going to be a largely MLS roster, and we're going to get into this right now. Okay, so these are the goalkeepers that I think go to Mexico. David Ochoa, Matt Fries, and JT Marcinkowski. Now, David Ochoa has been called into the last two camps and got injured, and he was injured a lot last season too, so that doesn't bode very well. Even though he's a very talented goalkeeper, there's some concerns about his ability to stay healthy. Matt Matt Fries was called in late to the squad in January and then beat out Brady Scott for a spot on the roster. And JT Marcinkowski has experience playing for the Quakes last season. Some possible European goalkeepers could be Chuturu Odunze. He was with the senior team back in November. He's under 23 eligible and not playing for Leicester. So there's a possibility he could be called in. But if I had to bet on it, these are the three goalkeepers I think we end up taking to Mexico. Now, remember, we can only take 20 players to Mexico. The roster has to be 20 and it has to include three goalkeepers. So we can only take 17 outfield players. And that means we need a few guys who are versatile. Sam Vines and George Bello will be the left backs in my opinion and Julian Araujo and Aaron Herrera will be the right backs. There are some European based fullbacks that could be in contention here mainly Ryan Reynolds. Reggie Cannon and Serginho Dest will probably be with the first team, but Matt Olosunde, Shaquille Moore, and Brian Reynolds are all playing in Europe. If Reynolds is not being used by Roma immediately, if they don't feel like he's going to be an immediate contributor for them, there's a good chance he could be on this roster, and I would rather see him there than a guy like Aaron Herrera. There's no real left backs in Europe except Anthony Robinson, and Anthony Robinson is going to be with the senior team. No way he makes it on this roster. Center backs. Okay, Mauricio Pineda and Miles Robinson are the two MLS center backs that are starters for their teams. Miles Robinson showed a decent passing range against Trinidad and Tobago, albeit under very little pressure. 
I have Abubakar Keita here as the third center back. Abubakar Keita is not the full-time starter for Columbus Crew, but I think he's the best of not a bunch of great options. Now, the European options were Chris Richards, Mark McKenzie, Eric Palmer Brown, and Cameron Carter Vickers. I thought maybe Chris Richards would be released for qualifying, but now that he's gone on loan to Hoffenheim, I think Hoffenheim is gonna wanna keep him there, and I don't think he makes it to Mexico. Cameron Carter Vickers, I don't really rate. Both Mark McKenzie and Eric Palmer Brown are contributors for their clubs. I don't think they let them go in the middle of the season. I would love to get either Mark McKenzie or Chris Richards for qualifying, but I really doubt it's going to happen. Midfielders, and this was a very tough one. We have five central midfielders, Jackson Yule, Andres Perea, Tanner Tessman, Paxton Pomacall, and Alex Mendez. Now, Paxton Pomacall was injured for most of last season, but for me, he is still the most complete American midfielder in MLS. He's played once for the senior team, hasn't been involved with the U23s because of injury. Hopefully by March, he's back and I can see him as a dark horse for this roster. Alex Mendez would be one of the creative forces on this team and is back playing and training with young Ajax. I think he's a guy they are very likely to let go because they don't see him as a key contributor, but he could be a number 10 attacking midfielder for us. Jackson Yule has lots of experience with the senior team, and I don't see a way that he is not on this roster. Andres Perea and Tanner Tessman both just made their debuts, but they are some of the few under 23 midfielders left in MLS I think can be contributors. Now, Johnny Cordoso is somebody that could be on this roster too. The main Brazilian season ends in February, according to my friend Filippo of Tactical Manager. By the way, great follow. Go follow him, guys. Uh, they do have State Cup in March, but he doesn't think that State Cup is that important. And Filippo thinks there's a chance that they release Johnny Cardoso for this, which I think would be a huge gain for this roster to give us some bite in midfield, which the five options that I've showed you here don't really have as much of. The other two guys that could maybe be released are Brendan Aronson and Owen Otisawi. Owen Otisawi is getting sporadic minutes for Wolves, but it's not like he's a starter for them. Uh, I think it's unlikely that they release him, but you never know what kind of wangling Brian McBride and Greg Berhalter and Jason Kreis can do. I think it would be great to get Owen Otisawi on the first team if we can't get Johnny Cordoso. Uh, one of them is gonna be with the senior team, so Tyler Adams is our starting six, and then either Otisawi or Johnny Cordoso is his backup. So hopefully if we could get the other one onto this roster, I think that would really give us a lot in midfield, which is where we don't have a lot of quality in MLS. Brendan Aronson is the other one. I know he's contributing with Red Bull Salzburg right now, but they have an American coach in Jesse Marsh there. And also Salzburg is a selling club. So maybe they would let Brendan Aronson go. Um, I doubt it. That might be wishful thinking on my part, but if I had to put money on it, these are the five that end up going to Mexico. Forwards, I'm a little bit happier with because we do have some forwards in Europe that aren't getting as much game time. Uli Yanez and Conrad De La Fuente are not key contributors for their clubs, and both of them could be massive contributors for the Olympic roster. I originally had Daryl DK on this roster, but now that he's going to Barnsley, I don't think that's gonna be an option anymore. Jesus Ferreira and Sebastian Soto will be the two forwards here. Now, Sebastian Soto, I know that he's with Norwich. I don't think he's going to play right away, or if he does, it'll be sporadic and very little at first. I think having options at forward is great. Soto would be your poacher. Jesus Ferreira would be more of your target man who can come deep. Jonathan Lewis could be a backup to De La Fuente and Yanez. Maybe a guy who can come on late in the game if you need a goal and use his pace, but I don't really rate Jonathan Lewis that highly. Other forwards who could come are Cameron Harper from Celtic. He's also not getting a ton of time. Uh, Joe Aquini over in the second division in France, but I doubt they're going to release him. And of course, there's Daryl DK. If Barnsley decides they can let him go for an extra couple of days, since it is the FIFA match date anyway, there's a chance he could be on here. But more likely than not, this is the forward pool that I see going to the Olympics. All right, guys, that's it for now. As always, thanks for watching. Leave your thoughts in the comments. I will respond. You guys have a great week, and I will see you next Tuesday.